but I'm, otherwise I'm gonna leave it, and we're not gonna follow, it's gonna be exciting today because we're not gonna follow the exact same order, um, and we'll go over that in a minute, okay? But in the meantime, I, without further ado, I'm gonna welcome Mr. Bagdell. Dextrose A, if you twist 
against my arm, will I admit that that is a polysaccharide? Yes, I will admit that it is a polysaccharide. Uh, in normal conversation, especially with foodie types like this, chefs, we would all call it by the name that we know it, which is cornstarch. Now, do I have enzymes that I can produce cornstarch into a fermentable, yeast accessible, simple saccharide? Yes, I do. Will it make good whiskey? No, it will not. Hence, malt. What we do is we mimic nature in a forced way. We take grain, and in our case, we use corn, oats, and rye. And we do it the same way for all of them. We have malting beds. We put the dry grain in there. We flood them with water for about 30 hours. That rehydrates the grain. And when that occurs, there's enough potential energy in the germ that it will manufacture four enzymes to it, which are very important. That's alpha and beta amylase. They go into the endosperm, and they will chop that dextrose using corn, dextrose all the way back down to dextrose 1 and sucrose. Once that occurs, that little cell stack in the middle of the germ says sucrose, that's food, and it grows a root out. Now, when you plant that in the cornfield, we do it the day before we expect heavy rain. In the malting beds, in our malting operation, we do it in, in beds that are like concrete uh, to live that way. And we force it to germinate. Once it germinates, and you'd rather use the term sprout, that's perfectly okay. I know two things. I know that the endosperm is full of simplified saccharides that are easily yeast accessible and will ferment very, very well. And what I'm actually after, I've got the maximum amount of the enzymes because I'm gonna use that in a much larger volume of regular ground grain. And I need to dissect the potential of the enzyme to reduce all of those complex saccharides. That's the front end of our operation on whiskey. It's not as complicated on rum or vodka, but I thought whiskey would be an interesting topic. Um, once we do that, we roast the malt because we've got to arrest the growth. We want to desiccate it. And we also imbue the malt with uh, terpenes that form in the smoke because the natural fire would use oak and cherry would be in our kiln. And that gives our malt, and you're going to notice it when we get to the, the whiskey here in a minute. I think you brought up that some whiskey with us. It's got a distinct smoky component, and that's not coming out of the barrel, it's coming out of the malt, which is why we go to all the trouble to do that. Uh, are we starting now with the first taste? Well, we, we can go with whatever whatever you want to do. If you want to finish talking or if you want to That's stop and Fermentation distilling is next. Wait, can you do me a favor? Because we haven't tasted spirits at all, like raw spirits right. at yeah, all yet yeah, this semester. Things. So can you give them a primer on yep. how to do a professional? Uh, Thank you. We, uh, we send our products and we go to uh, big, you know, judge tastings and all that. And it's, we, we, that one that you're going to taste here in a minute, was one of 4,000 entries up in Portland, Oregon. And as you might imagine, I am bombarded with emails and communications. Hey, send your stuff to our show, send your stuff to this show. And we're members of the American Distilling Institute, so when they send something, I kind of halfway read it. And so, Judge Whiskey Tasting up in Portland, yeah, that'll be okay. So I told our CFO, Jeff, they sent it to you. He threw it up there. We'll, we'll see what's going on. Well, once we signed up, we started getting all the actual literature on it. And that's when I started reading it carefully. So I, I asked Joe, I said, have you already shipped that up there? <laughs> he said, it's too late, it's gone. But we're gonna assemble the most prestigious panel of judges ever assembled. We're bringing them from Scotland, from Ireland, from France, from Japan, from Kentucky. And by the way, you're one of 4,000 whiskeys being submitted. I was like, oh, please, please, please. When this is over, I sure as hell hope our bottle is not the one they hold up and say, this is what not to do. <laughs> uh, and against all that, uh, that bottle of whiskey right there brought home the gold medal. We, we, uh, we actually beat 4,000 whiskeys. Now, uh, the way these fancy judges do it, and you do not have to raise your hand, but you can at their house. Well, hey, are we tasting the whiskey first? No, we're going to start with the, uh, with the with the Mary Black. The first glass. Oh, that's the, that's the yeah, the first glass on your left, everyone, left to right. This, this is a brandy that we make from Florida grown tangerines. We macerate the tangerines, press the juice, we ferment it, and then we age that on oak, and we actually put whole blackberries down in it. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of words of caution. This is one of two products that we make that we, we bottle at cast strength. 
Has that come up in your class before? The difference between like bottle strength and cask strength? No. Yeah. So all distilleries uh, fill barrels at a much higher strength than what's ultimately going to be in the bottle because you got you guys have all heard of the uh, angel share, right? Is that the term that you've heard? Yeah, I haven't told you about that yet. Okay. <laughs> You're catching them very early. Oh, okay. The uh, uh, barrels are porous and. Barrels in storage have to go through a thermal cycle every year. They've got to get hot in the summertime, they have to get cold in the wintertime. Alcohol is just thermoreactive, it responds. In the hot months, it expands and pushes against the staves of the barrel, and some of the very light esters actually leak through. In the wintertime, it contracts and it pulls back through, and when it does that, along with coming through the wood, stripping out vandalin and tannins and that kind of thing, it also pulls in a little bit of, a, of atmospheric water vapor. So what you're doing year on year is you're losing just a little bit through gaseous leakage through the barrel itself, and you're diluting it a little bit through atmospheric water vapor that's coming in. And that reduction, because we'll fill our barrel at 53 gallons at 120 proof, and then uh, yeah, I'm laughing at the slide. Oh, sorry. And then uh, <laughs> I thought you were laughing at me. Yeah. No. <laughs> but uh, then you know, four years later when we decant that barrel, it may only be. 51 gallons, and it may be 117 proof. So the missing portion in the industry is referred to the angel share. The barrel seal is bunged up and on a rack, and no one's got a long straw drinking it to feel all the savings. So someone got in there and got it. <laughs> Must have been the angels had a party. So but that is a, a, a cast strength product. It's something that's coming out of the barrel at the strength of, that we've aged it to. In the case of this, and uh, our accent, we actually do drop it down to only 106 proof. This is the strongest product we've ever tasted ours today. Made from tangerines, aged on oak with blackberries. And uh, the fancy judges refer, I think the name of that when you open your mouth. I can't remember. I haven't seen the moment. The way you start. Mm. Is, is you place the nose? Or the, well, there's actually a, a name for the process of filling your uh, olfactory, uh, basically. I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. You're not talking Doesn't about matter. Doesn't matter. The practice is this. Or the last day, I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that the, the way that they do it is, is they take the glass and they put it right under their nose. And with your mouth open, <coughs> breathe in the aroma. And the idea is there's going to be a lot of ethanol. This is 106 proof. Okay. But the idea is that you begin to identify any of the aromas other than the ethanol, and that's, that is the first step. The, the next thing, after you've done that, and you've burned your nostrils a little bit, take a tiny muscle and, and roll that around on your palate. And, and this is going to be, if you, you guys are not old country spirit drinkers like me, you, this is gonna be a strong step. Roll it around, and again, try to identify what you taste on what part of your tongue and palate, because it will be different on different parts of your so, come back. Evaluating a, uh, a, you know, something for a metal, um, 
I know we've got the most medals and awards of any facility in the world, but I don't remember how many there are because it's kind of the same way in a box and we get today and hang them up on our high value wall and then they're receiving it. Now the next thing to do on the same glass, take a, a, a very, very small amount of water, like two or three or four drops of water and put it in the glass. And when you do, just swirl it around. All this is going to do is open up some of the flavors and aromas that you would otherwise not get drinking it pure uh, in, in, its, in its pure state. And the, the fun thing about doing this style of tasting is uh, if you're paying attention, you'll notice different flavors and maybe different aromas. You do repeat the whole process. Get the nose with your mouth open at all. And then Take a little tiny sip after it's been you know, hit with the water. Except you don't get damaged. By the way, <laughs> you guys, I, I'm not expecting you guys to get damaged. It's great. <laughs> but it was, this, this was it more mellow? Yeah. Did, did you notice the difference? Yeah, yeah, but, it, and the aroma? Change it. That's the normal process at a spirit state. So once we have malt that has been roasted and grain, we grind all of that to the kind of uh, grist that we use, and then we start the mashing process. Has everyone heard about mashing, right? Again. They studied it this week, right? Yeah. What does mashing mean? Anybody? No? Where does the term come from? Any idea? They're scared you're going to make them sip again if you... <laughs> 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 this, is, this is a course for a, a, a grade, a letter grade on your, on your curriculum. So you're going you're gonna to have to practice. They're just cooking <laughs> things, so I'm giving them a okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have any of you guys ever cooked grits at home? Or seen your mom or dad yeah. cook grits? Yeah. And when you pour that in a pot, some of it floats on top, and they take a spoon and they stir it down into the hot water. We do the exact same thing, only a much larger pot. When the grist goes into our strike water, some of it won't sink down into the strike water, so we have tools that we literally mash it down into the mash tun. That's where the term mashing in comes from. It, it, big pot. Big pot. We, we've got some at 300 gallons, we've got some at 650 gallons. Uh, it's a big pot in which we're going to gelatinize the grist. Uh, you can think of it as cooking. We're extracting the polysaccharides from the grist into the striped water, which is the boiling water that it goes into, so that we can get at it with the enzymes that we're gonna extract out of the malt. And we have tools that do that, including something called a maltering rig, which you guys will probably learn about in beer making, probably, or certainly in spirits. And what we do is we, uh, we, we suck the liquid from below the grain bed in the mash tun, and we spray it back down on top of the grain bed and we create a recirculating column of liquid just going round and round and round through the grain bed, mechanically extracting the polysaccharides from the grist and mechanically extracting the enzymes from the malt and mixing those. And that begins the reduction of the, the complex saccharides down to simple saccharides, which we can test for. And that liquid, when it comes out of the mash tun, is now called wort, W-O-R-T. And that goes into a batching for an aggregate tank for us, uh, where we balance the chemistry. We adjust the pH to be the exact pH of the very specialized yeast that we use. Uh, and if it comes out of grain or molasses, we already know it's deficient in solid nitrogen, so that we will amend that wort. In our case, we use a mineral salt of ammonium phosphate. When we dissolve that in, it dissolves into the solid nitrogen in solution, and it makes that liquid perfect for the yeast. Once we achieve that, we bloom and pitch the yeast in it. As I say, we use very specialized yeast. Uh, and it activates in its aerobic life cycle. We then pump that, by the way, legally under federal law, once we put yeast on it, it's now beer. We pump the beer into a, a fermenter and we activate a bottom-mounted aeration system that keeps the beer oxygenated. By doing that, it keeps the yeast in their aerobic life cycle while they've got access to the dissolved oxygen, they don't make alcohol, they replicate. So I might inoculate a 600 gallon batch with say 200 grams of, of yeast. 
within 30 hours of the fermenter, I'll have 50 kilograms of yeast. And we do that on purpose. We're not a winery, we're not a brewery. I don't have any issues that they have about maybe having solids make it through the entire process because they're bottling fermented beverages. Ours are going to go through about four passes and stills. No solids are going to survive that. So we grow out our yeast very large. It gives us a swift fermentation. Uh, and that also prevents volunteer yeast because there is volunteer yeast in the atmosphere that will try it again if you, if you leave it too long. We ferment about seven days, uh, start to finish. And the way we do that is once we grow the colony out, we deprive it of oxygen. And it will consume the residual dissolved oxygen. Stress, which is an exothermic event, we monitor the heat on that because we don't want it to get too hot. Um, and then it converts to its anaerobic life cycle. In its anaerobic life cycle, it doesn't have enough energy to replicate. But if we've done our job properly and made those simple saccharides that we were talking about on the mashing and all that, they can stay alive by synthesizing the simple saccharides. And when they do that, there are two byproducts exactly equal by weight. One is carbon dioxide gas, the other is ethyl alcohol. So we generally shoot for somewhere ooh, um, about 1,000 pounds per batch in, in our 850 gallon fermenters. And over the course of a week, each of those will off gas around 500 pounds of CO2 and will leave behind around 500 pounds of ethyl alcohol, and that's roughly 90 gallons. That's how we make the alcohol. And it's one of the reasons that we bring every single process in house. Everything in that fermenter came from a farmer I know, or we grew. And uh, there's, there's nothing, uh, there, there are no strangers wandering around in there. So uh, once we do that, then the next step is beer stripping. And it means exactly what it sounds like. We strip the ethanol out of the beer, and that's, those are our largest stills. So uh, if we put 500 gallons of beer into one of our stills, we'll probably extract about 100 gallons out. Within that 100 gallons, which we call low lines, by the way, will be the 90 gallons of ethanol. So that's how we go from a fermented liquid to a distillate. So we then take that downstream into smaller, uh, uh, more complex stills where we do all the fine work. And there, there is a, a proof requirement on everything. I can't take whiskey over 160 proof. I can't take vodka under 190 proof. We do all of that work on much smaller, more controllable stills. Uh, and that produces something that we call high wine. So once we have high wine, we carbon filter it. In our case, we use pyrolyzed copra. Uh, Charcoalized coconut husks. <laughs> you know, nobody's seen them. Uh, and we, we put it all through the carbon, carbon filter, and then it goes into conditioning or aging. Our finishing process, we can actually fractionate the distillate, and that's very, very good for you guys and for our customers. In the glasses you're going to taste, there will be zero sodium cyanide, zero acetone, zero ketone, even though it's perfectly legal for me to sell that to you. Um, the, the Code of Federal Regulations, I can sell bottles containing a lot of nasty stuff, which is, I'm sure none of you have ever had a hangover, but, and, and this is not a challenge, and we just bring it up to you guys and try the challenge. I tell people on our tours all the time, so it, 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 it's not a challenge. Alcohol will dehydrate you. You can get dehydration headaches if you, if you don't stay hydrated. But if you stay hydrated, and you should have one of those nights with our products, in the morning, it's not that you will not have a hangover. In the morning, it's that you cannot have a hangover. We actually waste a measurable amount of our production containing the fractions, which is why I call it fractional distillation, that contain those compounds. We do that by molecular weight. And uh, at home tours at our place, I've had people tell me a hundred times, I have to do four or shit. And I say, well, yeah, it's not a challenge. And then I've got at least 1,500 messages and emails back that said, you know, I didn't believe this when we were doing the tour. And, you know, my wife and I, we really tied one on. And, now, if you tie one on that way and it's a real good one, you might still be drunk. If you, I mean, if you stop drinking at 5 o'clock in the morning, you, you might still be drunk when you get up at 8. But you, you will not have a hangover. Um, so that next step is conditioning or aging. And what we're doing is during the fractionation, it breaks the alcohol down into the smallest possible molecular structure which on our palate we perceive as hot or raw. Conditioning or aging 
is basically just us leaving alone for a number of years. Uh, I think the, the youngest thing you're going to drink is probably maybe 2017 or something like that. Which is the uh, Probably mint black. Uh, mm -hmm. Somewhere uh, around. I, I think it's the black. Oh, wait, it might be the black one. Okay. That's but, the youngest one that you want. Yeah. Um, so by leaving it alone for a number of years, those alcohol molecules, which we also put in uh, the majority of the fruity water at the same time, will combine and combine and combine into longer and longer and longer molecular structures, which we perceive on our palate as smoother and smoother and smoother. That's the whole purpose of that. Uh, barrel aging, you're also getting the mandolins and tannins that come out of the oak, and that also depends on how heavily you char the barrel. There's a lot of options on that. Also, it depends on if you roll them outside to the sunlight. Not that just the barrel aging process and barrel management is an art in and of itself. Uh, so once that happens, we uh, we do our final proofing. We're allowed one eighth of one percent variance. So uh, when we say it's eighty proof, using calibrated Class A certified labware, we have to test it, and it, and it has to test between seventy nine point seven five and eighty point two five proof. So it's one eighth of one percent on a temperature adjusted sample, by the way. And it's the same thing with that too. So we replicate the natural laboratory processes. Uh, it then goes through our what we call our plate filtration system, which are both canisters and plates. Uh, our filters are made, uh, the, the media is made by the Tall Corporation. It's not very complicated. It's uh, uh, basically a, a cellulose substrate impregnated with diatomaceous earth and perlite. But those filters are so good that if we chose, we could put brown whiskey through our filter system and bring it out clear. It, it, we don't, we only, we filter it out eight microns. But you could do that. And that's where every single distillery and winery and brewery in the world stops. We do one more thing because we know how. And it's the manner in which we run our filtration system. The way we do it is we set up a sterile catch vessel hooked up to the alcohol of the filter. We set up a feed vessel with the hops that we're gonna run through the filter. We then pull a vacuum on the catch vessel. That vacuum is what draws the product through the filters, accomplishing the filtration at eight microns. And that filtered product is now accumulating in a vessel being subjected to about 50 kilopascals, that would be one bar for the American measurement, 50 kilopascals of vacuum. And just like we do on the finished distilling where we separate out the most volatile things, which are the really vile little nasty bits, we do that by molecular weight. If it survives the finished distilling, and survive the carbon you know, filtration, and survive the eight micron filter, it's now accumulating in a vessel being subjected to vacuum and all of my alcohol is at its densest and longest molecular structure. That means the little wee tiny guys under vacuum vaporize and we exhaust them out through the, the vacuum system. So that's how we arrive at a bottle ready product. Questions? <laughs> You ready to come up to a day of distilled hands? <laughs> yes, please. No, seriously, you have any questions. I, I, I learned to distill in Mexico. Um, I, was, uh, I was tutored for seven years by a master distiller at a tequila distillery whose name you would know, but it's subject to an NDA, so I'm not going to tell you. Um, Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Is it fun? Oh, it's cool. It's I have, I have fermented and distilled some things, especially down in the tropics. No. Hard no, not, not doing that one again. Oh, black okay. sapote, black sapote. Oh yeah, okay. Uh -oh. Anybody yeah. in here know what that is? Uh, Some of you. It's like a custard apple, only the tissue's black. And down in Central America, you put a little honey on it and you stir it up and eat it like a dessert, you know, cut it in half. But uh, for some of us who, for various sins in our lives, have been in the jungle a bit, there's a, there's a terrible detail that sometimes happens where you have to uh, burn the shit, the drums. And uh, when we opened up the, the first fermenter of Black Support, I said, I've seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. Uh, oh, now, what is it? our next one is, what is the next one is? Uh, Conquistador. Right? So by the way, everybody, I hope you figured out on your sheet that the first one we tasted was actually the last one. Yeah. Sorry, we, we decided to Lottery, makes it up so the next the sec, the, the rest of, so really all you're doing is swapping number one and number four okay 
but we are going in consecutive order with, of what's up on the, uh, on the ledge. Does that make sense? A peach core is a whiskey we make out of 100% homegrown oats. It is a single malt whiskey. Uh, Ricky Philpott grows most of oats for us up in Columbia County. And uh, it should give you a fair amount of smoke on the nose and a fair amount of smoke on, on the initial sip. And you may, depending on how sensitive your palate is, and you guys are all young, your palate's all very sensitive, but you can, if you can get over the ethanol component, you may get a little toffee-like or caramel-like finish. So do the same thing as before. This one is 80 proof, it's not 106. Uh, and you should get a whole lot of tannic uh, from, from the breath. You had a question earlier, I'm not here, I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine, it was about the process. I was wondering, when you put the beer stripping, mm -hmm. what you did with the beer? Like, do you use it when you're stripping? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what we refer to that after we get the alcohol out is called pot ale. Um, in one process, we actually do a sour mash process and we take that pot and put it back to the fermenter with the grain bed and we do it but that's only one barrel of beer that we do at Silver Queen that we grow. The rest of the time we drain that out. We've got uh, dump wagons with sprayer and we take it out to our cornfield and we use it to uh, augment the, the quality of the soil that we grow corn. No, nothing goes to waste. No, they're, they're, nothing goes in the cardboard boxes that we get. We get them every day. We use to uh, sheet mulch cornfield and our raised garden beds and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's rare that we have to burn rubbish. Now, we do a lot of shooting as well, and unfortunately the calibers that we like to shoot chew up our target stands, so yeah, they end up in burn pit because they just fall apart. Uh, this one is the gold medal winner, the Kamakishi Gold. And uh, if, if any of you are whiskey aficionados, you may, you may enjoy this. Um, for those of you who are quite young, again, meat whiskey, is that's a that's a tough first start <laughs> experience. Right? So it can add a little water to this one. And yeah, these scents are good. Whiskey lovers, right? Whiskey lovers in the room? Yeah. Uh, and she's not saying fireball. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, the one out here, they've got a partner, Gordon Shen. 
Yes. But you know, it's Patterson family, and uh, it's the proverbial farmer's daughter that runs the food company. Okay. Sarah, she's she's a sweetheart. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, and one thing I will warn people, and I'm going to warn you the same thing. First of all, if you're drinking it neat, the proof on this is a little lower. This is only 70 proof. But this is not like a Smirnoff blueberry vodka where they make a grain alcohol and squirt a Cairo syrup flavor into it. This is what blueberries taste like. If you process and ferment and distill blueberries, that's what th that is. So that bottle contains blueberries and distilled rainbow strange water. That's it. So if you want to get that one out, it should be the clear one. We'll do the same process. You might get a little blueberry on the nose. Uh, it's vodka. It's not a sweetened. Disagree with this being a shot glass. <laughs> you can't speak. <laughs> In reality, this is a dram. It is an old apothecary measure. It refers to the one and one half fluid ounces that it will hold. In Scotland, which is what brought us to Wendy, you get an old country bartender like me, and you might go, here's a wee Grammy bag right there in the July with the coal fire going in the Highlands because you need it. It's freezing cold. And it usually rains by day. But <laughs> the way this came to be known as a shot glass is a fantastic slice of American history, and it's known around the world. I, I have worked in 28 different countries, and every single country I've been in, I ordered food, so I know that'll come as a shock to most of you. And I might order in a foreign language, but I'd use the English word shot, and they knew I was talking about this glass. The way this came about, was in the late 19th century. 
the United States was experiencing enormous immigration. At that time, it was mainly from Poland, Germany, and Ireland. Most of those immigrants were settling on the eastern seaboard. Our rail networks were not complete across the entire continent yet, and the growing population was putting upward pressure on commodity prices, including beef. And the price of beef finally got good enough that it became profitable for a rancher way out west to hire a handful of hands and drive her cattle across the prairie to a city like Fort Worth or St. Louis that had the marshalling yards and the rolling stock to ship that to the market on the eastern seaboard. That lasted for about 20 years. And that little 20 year slice of our history is what gives us the iconic image of a cowboy on a cattle drive. That's where that comes from. Now, cow hands were hired about the same way that sailors on whaling ships were hired at the same time, which is not on wages. It was on a per share basis. So if we sign up to go with the trail boss on this cattle drive, we're not getting wages. There will be no money at all until we arrive at the stockyard and he sells the herd and then he pays all the hands off. Which means in practice, as we cross this prairie for eight or nine or 10 weeks, we could be making camp a half mile from a nice little town that has a nice saloon and we can't go up to the boss and go, hey, can I get a half dollar advance on my wages? Because you don't have wages. And the answer is no. So you could, you could have a long, dry ride. There are some things that the boss had to provide. One was food. We all ate out of the same chuck wagon. That was their cost. The other was supplemental feed for our horses because horses are very inefficient digestive machines. They graze all day. Cows are much better. And if the cows are moving a little bit faster, the horses can't graze enough. And to that end, the boss supplies a little bit of supplemental feed for your horses because you had to have a, a good amount to do your job. And your job was to protect the money and the money was the cattle. And to that end, there's one other thing that the boss would supply. Since nearly every single one of us would have been armed with a 45 long colt, which I left at home, this came out of my gap automatic, but it's the same caliber. Uh, the reason the long colt was so popular is it'll go in your revolver and in your rifle, which means if you rode the perimeter, came back to the main camp and told the boss, hey, there was a wolf, I expended three rounds, he'd go to the supply wagon and he would give you these back. And that's how this whole thing came to be. We could be pushing the cattle near a little town known to have a telegraph office. And the boss might go, hey, you got to saddle up, ride into Benoa, go to the telegraph office and check. There might be a telegram from the owner. Could be, you know, price change, something having to do with the stock yard, maybe a buying agent, something. Check. Since you're in the telegraph office, here's a nickel. Send a telegram to the owner and let him know where we are. Since you're in town, go to the general store, here's a penny. Buy a newspaper and bring it back because we don't want to read it. And since you're in the general store, here's a quarter. Buy two pounds of coffee and bring it back to the chuck wagon because we're running low. And you could go, yes, sir. And you could saddle up and you could ride into that little town and ride it straight down Main Street and accidentally tie your horses up directly in front of the saloon. For that 20 year period, saloon keepers and barkeepers knew that cow hands had no money. However, in 1880, that dram of whiskey on the bar top would have cost you around 12 cents. And in the general store in 1880, that 45 long cold cartridge would have cost you around 12 cents. And for about a 20 year period, a, a known barter system arose. Cow hands could come in, pull a cartridge or two off. <laughs> served his dram of whiskey. That is the glass that we literally exchanged a shot for. And it's doing around the world. Well, he's doing around. <laughs> now I got a question. Do we have any veterans in here? Uh, no, we go off three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Put this on your bar at home. And, and someone asks you, why do you have a, a cartridge in there? You say, well, I'll tell you the story of the shot glass. Thank you. All right, now with that, I'm basically wrapped up, except we can taste the flat drum. Now, this is a very different kind of product. 
from the other kind of egg. This is the sweetest of the new egg. It is our best selling rum. And all rum starts out as silver rum coming out of the finishing system. It looks just like that. We then turn it into gold rum with oak. And we do put a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of ground nutmeg in it. And hand grind it. It's like salt in a soup. You can't taste it. It just tastes better if it's in there than it's not. We then take the, uh, the, the gold rum and we make a homemade butterscotch sauce. We use Florida brown sugar, Florida butter. Uh, we do make a dye out of blackberries, blueberries, and the sepals of Hibiscus saporita, uh, which is just is in rum. It's, it's a dye we end up with making very dark rum, and we put that in there, and a little tiny bit of molasses goes back into it. And the molasses going back in is by law what makes this a black rum. It's not the color. You, we can make a clear black rum if we want to do it. If molasses goes back in, the category it falls under the, the TPD is black rum. So I would recommend doing this the same way. Take a little nose. You might smell a little bit of the butterscotchy aromas on the nose. And then take a little tiny sip. Happy to take any question about either the distilling process or the products themselves. Do you want to learn what an azeotrope is? Yeah, <laughs> please. That's how we distill. Does anyone know what that is? Or, or is this like the eyeball blazing moment? <laughs> azeotrope is a solution that's comprised of more than one compound with different vapor points. So ethyl alcohol will boil at around 171 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, stills are open systems, so the only pressure in those is usually under a half a pound, and it's the back pressure as steam goes up the column. Um, yeah, if we, if we seal them up, then they become bombs. But the, the, the azeotrope starts, in the case of our product, is as the charge in the still comes up to around 171 degrees, the alcohol begins to boil, and the water does not. So the, the steam coming up into the, the rest of the machine is actually ethanol steam, and that's what we trap and run through condensers to actually form it as an ethanol constituent. So that, that's the whole point of that. Now, we can do the same thing with vacuum. Um, it's all oil's law. It, it's, you know, it's like a three-part rubber band. 
you pull one leg of the rubber band, the other two contract. You know, you pull two of the legs of the rubber band, the other one contracts. It's, 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 it's always balanced. And we do use that, as I mentioned, in our, in our full tracer systems. And have you ever heard the term of the oil refinery? That giant cracking column? That's simply a still column, it's a plate column. And they do use a, a vacuum in the, the refining process because, of course, they're any of you guys taking chemistry? No. You never I think most of these students are hospitality. Yeah. <laughs> Correct? Yeah. Well, there, there's an there's a instrument in the chemistry lab that's called a rotary evaporator. It's the same thing it's, except for it's pitch top. I mean, you can bring something to temperature, then pull a vacuum on it. It will, it will accelerate the distillation very, very swiftly, which is why they use these things for it. Um, no questions at all? Oh, I got lots of questions, but I want to defer to you. <laughs> Of these four here, we, we make 27. Um, and over the years, in many years, uh, in other countries, I, I developed nice uh, taste for smoky whiskeys. So we didn't bring the one that is my favorite. Which is so you have one that's even smokier. Well, oh, more, far much, more smoky much. than this. And I refer to that as my cigar whiskey. So <laughs> Perfect. When we were sitting late at night and smoking a cigar, that's the whiskey I was smoking most often. I've got a couple of friends that are my same age group and same mileage, basically. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's my wife tells me all the time. It's kind of, you can make those sounds get out of bed when we were younger. <laughs> but uh, it is, uh, it's very smoky. Um, we can't make a scotch because we're not in Scotland. Uh, just like we can't make a, yeah, I know how to make that. But we're not in Jalisco, Mexico, so I can't do that. But you know who missed the boat was Kentucky. The state of Kentucky absolutely missed the boat. They should have got a denomination of Alpeni for the word bourbon. Correct. Restricting it to manufacturing in the state of Kentucky that just anyone can make a bourbon, and they all do, and that's why we need one. Uh, ours are all straight whiskey. Um, and if you don't mind a slightly racy joke, I'm going to make my dad joke when I've got people out the at Tiki Bar. So the fact that they're straight whiskey doesn't mean they're not good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a straight mash bill. And, uh, but yeah, I, we do now have a, a new classification in America called American Single Malt, which was lifted directly out of the rules and regulations of Scotland to define what scotch is, and it can be made here. And uh, I just finally sourced some barley being grown in Florida. My philosophy is we're gonna do business with our neighbors, so um, if we can get enough barley, then we'll actually make American Single Malt. It is scotch and all that name. And I'm kind of interested to see if what our heat and cold pattern is going to do with all the barrels do. Because, if, you know, in Cali, we get a lot colder than you guys down here. And we get freezes every day. And our big doors are open all the time because we've got the CO2 venting out all the time. Um, so our barrels can get quite cold in the winter. And then in the summer, we get up like here, we get up to high 90s or 100 degrees, and the barrels get hot. Curious, because that is not what it's like in Scotland. Did you ever go to Scotland? Not yet. It's on the list. Yeah, the, 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 and of course, between, for example, the whiskeys that are, or the tequilas that are aging in Mexico oh, yeah. age a lot faster because of the warm weather. Well, Although some you, parts you, you of almost Mexico, have that right, because people will say that you can't accelerate time. It doesn't age faster. It matures. Okay. My, my I have people come and say, hey, I saw, I went to this place, and they've got accelerated aging. I said, Go read the line sign. <laughs> you can't actually accelerate time, sure. uh, but you can extract the, the barrel compounds. And, and there's two classes that come out of the barrels that really count. There's a bunch of stuff in barrels. And it really varies by how deeply you char the interior of the barrel mm -hmm. and whether or not the interior of the barrel is scored or not, which increases the surface area. Um, so with those variables, uh, the two things that are mainly important are uh, tannic. Tannic acid, tannins, and uh, a group of products that we collectively just call vanillins. And as the name implies, it's where you get uh, sort of a, van a vanilla-like flavor uh, in some lightly aged uh, product. Uh, the longer it's in the oak, the more pronounced the tannins are going to be. Um, uh, and as you notice in the kind of whiskey, uh, very smoky up front. 
not that that has to do with the, the exposure, the, the charge of, uh, which we do that on purpose because that's a cycle profile we're going to. And again, that sells mainly to, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, probably middle-aged and older men who like whiskey. Occasionally, we'll get ladies, we'll, we can have the ladies' whiskey club drop in and they love it, and, which is fun. Um, but that, that generally goes to uh, demographic profiles that is, is not dissuaded by the price. Um, we, just, at, we are a business, so at the end of the day, we need to sell a product. So we can't just you know, arbit arbitrarily stick a price on something and say, hey, it's too big. We, we do have an idea of who buys each of our, of our products. Questions? Yes, sir. Last year, you're asking if there are any mixes or modifiers that you can use specifically for those kinds of questions. Well, I'm going to defer the mixers and modifiers to that young man. Is this possible? Okay, I'll take it out. But um, if you're talking about cocktails and that kind of thing, um, the brandy, a lot of times when I get people who don't understand what it is, I'll treat it like a whiskey for them. So it's ours, old fashioned, and I had all of those old school whiskey cocktails. A lot of people don't know all of those cocktails were originally brandy cocktails. Brandy was the drink of the hoity toity a hundred years ago. So when whiskey became popular with the hoity toity today, they started using the brandy recipes. Um, so you can treat that very similarly to that. Now we're not snobs, but a lot of people make that mistake. If you want to pour that on Coke, go ahead. If you enjoy it that way, that's fine with us. Same thing with our whiskey and the same thing with our vodka. And the vodka mixes just as well as any other vodka. I will only make one qualifier to that. Don't make a dirty monkey. It is a blueberry vodka. It doesn't mix with all of you. Exhibit A. Um, <laughs> I want to follow up on your comment about snobs. One of, the, one of the questions we get asked all the time, uh, especially from people that, as a recreation, they'll go to distilleries and breweries and wineries, and they'll come in sometimes and say, you know, so when they find out that I'm the, I'm the distiller, they'll say, oh, well, what's the best whiskey in the world? And I, I always say, okay, it's, it's the one you like to drink. <laughs> Whatever it is that you like to drink. And then there's one caveat to that. If you can get a bottle of whiskey out of your neighbor's liquor cabinet when he's not looking and get home with it, that's the best whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys are uh, up to speed? Or no, no more questions. Yes, ma'am. Hey, you've got 106 and then 80, 80, 80. Uh, 70, 70, 70 for the vodka. Oh, 70, for the vodka. 70, 70 for the vodka. And you guys remember proof versus ABV, right? Yeah. What's the difference? Half is what? There you go. Pour some of your distillate on it and light it, and if it whoosh up, then it was proved. It had been proved, and uh, not a not a very accurate way to do it, but <laughs> that's where that uh, arose. And the other little story, if you want, is the word whiskey. Does anyone know what that means? Whiskey. That we haven't gotten that far yet in science. Well, distilling was discovered in uh, I think Egypt by the Arabs. Uh, there was a long history of uh, Alembic stills there for the perfume business. And I'm sure that it didn't take very long for the guy there making perfume to pour some beer in the still for the next run. And what came out is a substance that they call A L hyphen K H O L alcohol. That's where we get the word alcohol. Well, when that part of the world was conquered by Rome, and Rome Christianized, the monasteries became the center of, of learning. That's where a lot of chemistry was being done, a lot of alchemy was being done, a lot of 
astronomy being done, and a fair amount of astrology being done, and they grab the distillery process in that as part of the search for the elixir of life. And as they made their very first batches, they named it in the language of the learned at that period, which was Latin, they named it Acredite, Water of Life. Well, that spread across the entire empire. And at the height of the empire, the furthest most northwestern province was known as Hibernia. We know it today as Ireland. And that information went there. And of course, the nobles, the, you know, the clan chiefs, sent their children to the monks to be educated and taught Latin because you want to be able to communicate in the language of the empire. And they learned about the water of life, Acredite. And when they came home on winter break, talked to mom and dad, they brought some back with them, and mom and dad said, what is it? And they said, Acredite. And they said, no, 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 it's Gaelic. You know, what we actually speak. And they translated it, and Ireland it was Riscabat. No, two boxes, Riscabat. And I estimate it took about five minutes for that knowledge to cross the Irish Sea into Scotland, where the same exact thing was going on. And mom and dad spoke a different dialect of uh, Gaelic there, and the, the same word, Water of Life, was Riscabat. And in the normal march of history, England conquered Scotland. Edward III got there, and after the peace was made, they were serving their new overlords and the English, by the, by the time that this happened, the English had already emerged as a language. Because English is just French pronounced with Germanic pronunciation, Germanic syntax. 60 to 70% of our words are direct cognates out of French. We just don't pronounce it the same way. Someday we'll just call it French to Siberia, which is that's why it's better. But they were trying to explain to the English what Riscola was, and the English was what that was. Whiskey. And that's how we got the term. Whiskey. It's a mispronunciation of the Gaelic translation of the Latin description, Aquadite, of the original Arabic alcohol. And we know that as whiskey. You good? You guys want to ask me questions? I will, I'm happy to answer any questions you want. Oh, we got a question back here. Oh, yes, I have a question. How often do you try like creating different profiles and like is there different equipment, like smaller equipment that you use to like not? We're not starting a new action? experiment, which we always do. Uh, in fact, we terminated one uh, last week. We we left out in the woods. We can get raw salt palmetto berries, so we mash some. And, we might try that again next spring after I do a little more research. I'm not sure my enzymes are exactly the right ones. We've got it to ferment, but what we will do is we will start in a very, very small amount. We'll make, uh, say, uh, 10 or 12 gallons of beer because I've got three uh, what we call lab stills that, that can take 15 gallons at a time. Um, and the, it doesn't cost very much to do a 15 gallon batch of anything. So we'll ferment that. We, uh, we make copious notes because if you know when we hit up one that's really good, the last thing in the world we want to do is say, "Oh, exactly, did we make that?" You know, no, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we make copious notes, and uh, we will ferment it and, and document uh, all its uh, bricks, specific gravity, uh, pH, and temperature every day. Then distill it, and we taste the distillate as it goes and. Uh, because those small batches are really inefficient, even using small equipment. The, the bigger the equipment, the more efficient it runs. So we will we will keep it and then rerun it a couple of times to see if, if it gets distilled three times, is it better? Four, four times or something like that. Um, we always have to dispose of the, the, the four shots, the head shots, and the fangs, which is where the cyanide and that kind of thing is. Um, and then we don't use anything that comes out of the still lower than 100 uh, proof, or lower than 50 ABV. Now, we don't throw that away, we call that tails. We put that into the next batch to enrich it because it's still half alcohol. And uh, it will come back through and head, you know, heads will get cut off again, so it doesn't, we're not contaminating anything. And as nasty as it sounds, US did a great set of experiments some years ago. Do you know what mycotoxins are? Yeah, okay. The food management part of your, 
degree is probably going to get into that because they're really, really bad. Um, in corn, specifically aflatoxins is one of them, and it's actually lethal. And that's why when you see big elevators, they actually have bores that go down into the, the stacks of corn and they take those samples out and test it periodically if they require it. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is UF intentionally contaminated some beer with a series of these mycotoxins and then distilled them to see what would happen. And happily enough, apparently you can't bring a contaminant over in distillation. Not one, not one contaminant came over. Not really a problem, it's not. I mean, we can keep an eye on our earth, but it, you know, if the salt ever was in the back of your mind, it's okay. Some kind of strange fungus in there somewhere. It won't survive distillation. Um, yeah, the, so the answer, your, answer your question, we start small. When we get a, a positive response, we might bring that up to say the 50 gallon-ish level. We're, we're almost approaching the production level. And if that still comes out good, then we'll go ahead and do a small production level, say 250 gallons or something like that. Because it, the, the size of the stills and the size of the batch do not progress in a straight line. The equipment operates a little bit differently. The fluid dynamics are a little bit different, including the main one is where the vapor goes through the condensers, that kind of thing. So we get a slightly different result as we increase the size uh, of what we're doing. Including better now? yields, sir. In including better yields oh, off yeah, of the larger equipment. Yeah, if we were to put a thousand gallons through our smallest stills, you know, in sequence, as opposed to putting a thousand gallons through our big still, uh, the yields are going to be very different, and the flavor will be very different. So, do any of you guys know of the show on the History Channel called Moonshine? He was the guy that, that they originally made that show about. He's passed now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, my grandmother was Ruth Sutton from the Houston Tribune. So our property up in Georgia has a couple of stills in it with Pat Pat Morrison in it <laughs> from back in the day. Yeah, that's cool. So the apple doesn't fall all that far from the, from the tree. Anything else? Some are true pot stills, which is it's the boiler and the vapor line into a condenser. Some are the modified column with uh, a, a, a reflex column on it that's full of a sheet ring with pre coolers in it, which allows us to, to striate the vapor by density, which is how we sequester off the stuff we don't want to have in it. Uh, our largest uh, beer stripper, uh, referring to Moonshiner, my great great uncle would have referred to it as a 500 gallon double thumper with a 10 foot shotgun condenser <laughs> on it. <laughs> but the, that, that actually is a uh, triple distillation in line. Different from a true fractionating still where you've got the plate that you accumulate a plate and you can drain off each plate based on what it is that you're trying to collect out. Um, you, the way that works is there's a deflector mode that goes on the top and, and you chill the top so the the gas can't pass through into the condenser, and the, the vapor will accumulate based on its uh, vapor point at different levels in there, and it will condense on the collector plate. And uh, little sight glasses, if you've seen one of those things with the little glass windows in there, so you can see it's there, and then you open the, the pit valve, the pit cut valve, and you just drain what's on there. And so you can get a extremely narrow fraction of what you're of what you're distilling if you choose to. Um, and if we were making neutral vodka, that's the kind of still we'd, we'd be doing, but it's not what we do, we, we make flavor vodka. We, all of our processes are, are aimed around collecting a great deal of flavor out of the fermentable substrate. And that is the key, by the way, when you guys go around and visit places, the number one thing about 
the flavor of what you're going to consume in distilled spirits. The number one most important thing is the fermentable substrate. If you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So that's always the first thing. But the second most important thing is the process water. In our case, we use spring water because we have it. That's why we located where we did. But the fermentable substrate and spring water, or water are going to have more influence and more effect on what you get out of the end of the process than anything else. The third most important thing is the yeast variety. The still is only the fourth most important. If you have a great substrate, good water, and you use the wrong yeast, you, the, still, the stills take away the concentrate. They don't add. So by the time anything goes into a still, it, it's being reduced and concentrated. So yeah, you, the, the hard part of this industry is get it right on the front end. It's kind of like uh, in cooking, I don't know if you guys remember the culinary course, but it's kind of like in cooking, there's the meats and sauce, right? Have it all cut, ready to go. So you just have to assemble it. it, it it's analogous to that. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. It's actually a group of compounds that are very chemically similar. And they're volatile, basically the same basic form, which is why it's easy for us to get them out. Um, but yeah, if you if you had a headache one morning, not that that would ever happen to us, and I can be able to play their cue, but if that has ever occurred to someone you know, um, it, it's probably the, the compounds that were left in. Uh, and it's understandable from a perspective, you know, if you change tax here for a minute, I talk about Tax distillery, we talk about distillery in general. Distilleries are a business. They want to sell product. And if I was a distiller at a big, big distillery, and I went to the board meeting one day and said, I want to throw away $10 million worth of our production this year. So I'm going to cut this out of the production queue. They would go, That's really interesting, Matthew. I hope your new employer allows you to do that because you no longer work here. I understand the commercial pressure. We, uh, we're in the very lucky uh, state that we're small enough that we can use it. And I don't throw it away, I can't, it's, it's liquid taxes. But we do use it to light fire, clean stainless steel. We've got a use, we don't throw anything away. I love the sustainability of it. Well, you know, waste not, won't last. That's awesome. So it's, it's actually the end, believe it or not, it's 545. Oh, are we done? So could, could you tell us quickly where we can find your product and see your logo? Down here. And, uh, and here. Tour that you're, tour that you're the tour that you're distilling. So uh, down here in Orlando, your best bet, uh, we're in several of the regular Hilton bars if you just want to have a drink. Um, then for package tours, we are in ABC and Total Wine down here. Uh, actually, from Christmas, Florida, all the way over to uh, Treasure Island in Tampa. Uh, so if you ever go to the beach that way, you can find us over there too. But um, then mom and pops are actually your best bet for us. Uh, ABC's price points are very low, so they usually only carry our rum. Some, sometimes the brandy, sometimes the vodka. Um, we, we are a very small batch, so Total Wine's a better bet if you want a box store. But your best bet is uh, the mom and pops, the really high end mom and pops. They carry a wide selection of our products, including the whiskey. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean to cut you short, but I, I also want to be mindful of our listeners. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.